that we have here at the Climate Change Commission. Our site event is, uh, of course, focused on the outcomes, uh, challenges, and opportunities of the climate change inquiry, uh, the human rights of the uh, Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. On the 6th of May, uh, 2022, the Philippines Commission on Human Rights officially released the findings of its national inquiry on climate change. And this inquiry actually was initiated in 2015 after a petition by grassroots activists. And it is the world's first investigation into corporate liability into human rights violations linked with the climate crisis. This side event will discuss how its outcomes will impact different streams of climate action moving forward, including uh, on climate litigation, both uh, domestic and uh, international, uh, loss and damage, which of course at COP27, uh, hopefully it will be a priority, and of course higher ambition for both adaptation and mitigation. Today, uh, this afternoon, we'll have uh, our speakers from the Philippines uh, virtually, of course, live. Uh, we have with us, uh, you're familiar with him uh, because of the Warsaw uh, uh, International Mechanism. We have Yeb Sanyo, now the Executive Director of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. We have also an environmental lawyer, Attorney Grisel Damayo Anda. He, she's the Executive Director of the Environmental Legal Assistance Center. Uh, a climate activist and a Typhoon Haiyan survivor uh, representing the, the young people, Ms. Marinel Obaldo, and the Deputy Executive Director for Programs and Campaigns of Limang Langdato Sea Philippines, Mr. John Leo C. Algo. And uh, of course, to respond uh, uh, moving forward would be our Minister and Secretary of the Philippine Climate Change Commission. So right now, may I uh, of course introduce uh, one of our champions for WIM, uh, Mr. Nadrev M. Sanyo, uh, to discuss uh, perspectives from the petitioners of the National Inquiry on Climate Change and Human Rights. Yeb. Thank you very much, Rodney. And uh, good afternoon to all of you dear friends who are there in Bonn. Again, my name is Yeb Sanyo. I am a former climate negotiator and I now head the diverse operations of Greenpeace in Southeast Asia, including leading the work on climate justice and liability. Um, in particular, this, this whole journey um, regarding our petition uh, on human rights and climate change with the Philippine Commission on Human Rights. Let me begin by borrowing words from Maurice Strong, who in 1992, during the Earth Summit in Rio, uh, when he was Secretary General of the UNSED, said that history reminds us that what is not possible today may be inevitable tomorrow. This is perhaps resounding quite strongly today as we celebrate the outcome of the National Inquiry on Climate Change in the Philippines. The findings of the Commission on Human Rights are a vindication for the millions of people around the world whose fundamental rights are being impacted by the corporations behind the climate crisis. This verdict, and I'd like to call it a verdict because it, it is, is historic and sets a solid legal basis for our assertion as petitioners that climate destructive business activities by fossil fuel and cement companies contribute to human rights harms. The message is quite clear. Corporate behemoths cannot continue to transgress human rights and put profit before people and planet. And governments cannot continue to abet this. We believe that the era where the biggest polluters can get away with and profit from their toxic practices is coming to an end. And impacted communities at the front lines of the climate crisis will continue to assert their rights and demand justice. We also, of course, commend the Philippine Commission on Human Rights for its commitment to uphold climate justice. It sets a courageous example for many other institutions as well as governments around the world 
and with the already profound threats of this climate emergency, the CHR, the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines, is showing us the way. Now, the recent developments around the world, whether it's a political stage or the, the, the escalating impacts of climate change, show us just how important it is for us to stand together to make sure that those who hold the most power and resources stop crushing people's basic rights, including the rights to a st stable climate and a healthy environment. In the past several years since we started this journey shortly after Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, the Philippines continued to be battered perennially by the most destructive typhoons. When I was still the country's lead climate negotiator in the UNFCCC, I appealed to the entire world and I said, we can take drastic action now to ensure that we prevent a future where super typhoons become a way of life because we refuse as a nation, as a people, to accept a future where super typhoons like Haiyan become a fact of life. We refuse to accept that running away from storms, evacuating our families, suffering the devastation and mis misery, having to count our dead become our way of life. We simply refuse to. This is also the impetus, this is also the inspiration, and together with at least 20 organizations and 16 community leaders, climate activists, typhoon survivors, indigenous people, communities, trade unions, youth, women, and in many other sectors here in the Philippines, we lodged the Climate Justice and Human Rights Petition at the Philippine Commission on Human Rights in 2015. Now, what we see as well is a groundswell of climate litigation around the world. Currently, that number has reached more than 1,500 uh, pieces of climate litigation across at least 40 countries. This is a growing tidal wave of cases and this will bring about change much needed change and these cases really deserve our attention because communities are resorting to the courts to challenge entrenched power in this crucial time to secure the ambitious climate action needed to avert the worst impacts later my dear friends and, and colleagues you will hear about the findings uh, of this case but I'd like, to, I'd like to offer that one of the insights we have gathered from our case in the Philippines against the 47 carbon majors is that courts are not the only venue for climate litigation or climate action. National human rights institutions prove to be very important venues in an ideal, in, in an, an ideal mechanism since climate change is a global issue. It has no boundaries and a human rights institution can prove to be a great place for lodging an issue like climate change in relation to human rights. Filing a case before a human rights institution also allow us to avoid the rigidity and the technicalities that may be involved in regular courts of law. And it can give us a platform to inform all stakeholders at this, as it has for us in the past seven years. And not just stakeholders, but also duty bearers, duty bearers for human rights, since there will be a global conversation on the issue. The political climate has also been a challenge, as we have seen over many years. And even with the Paris Agreement in 2015, Today, we, we, we realize that even, even such an international agreement can prove to be uh, lacking in terms of moving the, uh, the needle of ambition that is necessary to avert the climate crisis. And even if there would be legal wins, even if there are, uh, even if there are important victories and, and even uh, steps in the right direction in the international efforts, um, to find lasting solutions to the climate crisis. It could, it could hardly be felt on the ground if 
these are not translated into actual actions and policies. And this is exacerbated by a lack of political will to honor carbon emissions reductions commitments, as we have seen, and we are hurtling towards a 2.7 degrees Celsius warmer world. And the passive or business as usual attitude of both policymakers and, and, and corporations and banking heavily on people's ability to adapt and cope and remain resilient. So access to climate justice is not easy, especially to communities since there are not uh, many experts who can help us. There are not many lawyers who have the experience uh, who can actually take on all of these cases. And in, in, in our experience, in our case here in the Philippines, we also deal with the danger to the life of the lawyer and the litigants. The Philippines, I must emphasize, is one of the deadliest countries for environmental lawyers and environmental defenders. It also takes so many years for any case filed in court to actually move and progress, except if dismissed on technical grounds. And this has to change if we genuinely want to achieve the climate justice. And when we are talking about people powered cases in the context of climate litigation, we want to ask, we want to be sure, are we also taking care of uh, truly building an atmosphere in which the communities we, can, we, we work with can more readily, readily function, organize and move forward beyond all of these legal proceedings? Are we taking uh, much, much needed wis wisdom from the communities we represent and build these strategies together? Are we recognizing that the climate crisis has deep structural roots that can cannot simply be litigated away and that a court case will not necessarily mean justice? Are we approaching the process from a space of long-term collaboration and humility? Are, how are we addressing the calls of frontline communities for justice and a dignified life beyond legal frameworks, beyond international conversations? When do we not only focus on reforming the way uh, it is seen, for example, by those in the judiciary, but also being able to address um, the, the, the aspirations of communities and co-powering people to build their own power and agency in the way uh, that, they, that they envisage. From our experience in our Philippine case against the 47 carbon majors, community work has been crucial to change mindsets and behavior. So irrespective of the outcome, and we got an outcome that was close to what we prayed for, we want to have change on the ground. Therefore, we actively engage with communities, and this has been uh, the inspiration we have seen in many parts of the world. And, well, and, 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 and overall, what is important to remember is that, um, you know, all of these cases is about more than obtaining a judgment. It is a larger process in which human rights law is just one tool towards the ultimate objective of lasting change. When the Philippines Commission on Human Rights finally published its verdict, you know what I saw and what I felt? I saw hope, the same kind of hope I felt listening to all the testimonies from frontline communities, legal experts, scientific experts, and the other legal actions that we've seen in the past few years, including among many, now close to 2,000 cases, Juliana versus the United States, the story of the FEMA senior involved in the Swiss climate lawsuit, the people versus Arctic oil in Norway, the story of Sol Luciano Liuya, the brave Peruvian farmer who has sued a coal company as his community deals with glacial lake outburst floods, the Urgenda case in the Dutch Supreme Court, the milieu defense case versus a fossil fuel giant in The Hague, the Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu calling on the ICJ to provide an opinion on the legal obligations of countries in preventing and addressing the climate crisis. Having all of these journeys intersect with each other is just so inspiring. And these stories provide us with so much courage, no end. And the strength of communities behind these cases give us all renewed hope. Now, I want to emphasize that governments 
and corporate behemoths re responsible for the lion's share of cumulative global emissions who we have implemented in our petition in the Philippines are now facing the collective, I must say, indignation of youth, of seniors, of fishers, of farmers, of islanders, of highlanders, indigenous peoples, survivors of climate events, grassroots organizations, trade unions, people from different walks of life. Ultimately, to achieve climate justice, we must all recognize that the climate emergency threatens human survival, the environment, and the enjoyment of all human rights as this national inquiry has, 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 has uh, brought to the fore for present and for future generations. We must also recognize that although the climate crisis is a global problem affecting everyone, it disproportionately affects persons, groups, and peoples in vulnerable situations who see their rights violated and who are subjected to multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. The climate crisis also impacts countries unequally. We all know that. It results in an increase in conflict and political instability, as well as food insecurity, displacement, and migration. We need to challenge the powers that be who are using the climate breakdown and the need for environmental protection as excuses to deny human rights. It bears much to emphasize that the climate crisis is a matter of justice. It bears much to emphasize as well that almost all of these carbon majors are domiciled in the global north, in the UNFCCC's Annex 1 countries, in the rich industrialized nations, in nations with the largest greenhouse gas emissions and largest historical responsibility for the climate crisis. I also want to highlight that the challenge to national human rights institutions, as we have seen in our case, is to test boundaries, create new paths, to be bold and creative instead of timid and docile, to be more idealistic or less pragmatic and I'm quoting from the report itself, to promote soft laws into becoming hard laws, to see beyond technicalities and establish guiding principles that can later become binding treaties. In sum, to set the bar of human rights protection to higher standards that is according to this report. Now, will we look into the eyes of our children and confess that we had the opportunity but lacked the courage? that we had the solutions, but we lacked the vision. And my dear friends, we also want to remind ourselves, let me say, that this battle will not be won or lost in the plenary halls. They will, they will be won or lost at the grassroots. And even if we do our best in the pursuit of climate justice in the chambers of law, these battles will not be merely won or lost in the chambers of law. They will be won or lost in the chambers of people's hearts. The results we have seen from the Commission on Human Rights verdict will serve as crucial building blocks for all of the efforts being led by many communities around the world to hold to account all of those who are wreaking havoc on the climate, fossil fuel industry, the big polluters. And therefore, we want to stand together and along with the substantive findings of the CHR to this verdict. It is our hope that it pours in even more energy and that is our belief that it would provide more vibrance and strength for the entire climate movement, for all of us who believe that another world is possible. So thank you very much, my dear friends. Thank you so much for this opportunity to have this conversation. And uh, I want to thank the organizers of this side event, Action Clima, and uh, to all of our colleagues in this panel, uh, esteemed panel, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Yeb, um, um, presenting the per perspectives from the petitioners of the National Inquiry on Climate Change. Uh, we have now uh, Attorney Griselda Mayo Anda, the Executive Director of the Environmental Legal Assistance Center, to uh, discuss the major findings of the National Inquiry on Climate Change, its implications 
on climate litigation. Attorney Jerley. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I um, the slide can be seen. Can it be seen, Rodney? Uh, not yet. I think you need not to yet. present okay. the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I hope it can be seen. So, Attorney Jerty is... Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it... I'm trying to... <laughs> this is the first time I... Uh, you minimize the window uh, first. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, minimize. <laughs> Just like carbon emissions. <laughs> Just like the carbon emission, you minimize. And uh, Attorney Jerty has been there. Uh, advising the petitioners, and uh, I believe she's one of the councils uh, as well. Okay, is that okay? Uh, I... yeah, there, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. I hope it's big enough. Yes. Okay. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Thank you to Action Klima and all our colleagues for organizing this side event. I'm uh, truly glad that uh, our colleague Yev Sanyo has uh, very incisively and also uh, full, of, full of inspiration expresses insights on this uh, climate justice journey. Now, just uh, quickly, um, the issue in this case is basically whether or not the respondent carbon majors must account for okay, the impacts to human rights uh, resulting from the operations of their businesses uh, because of the greenhouse gas emissions that they have so far failed to curb despite their knowledge of the harms caused. So the objective is to really highlight the human rights implications of climate change. Now, the position actually of the petitioners led by Yen that the fossil fuel industry has a legal and moral obligation to actually make sure that their uh, business activities will prevent harm uh, on the people and the communities, and uh, also that they already knew about climate change half a century ago, yet they have continued to mine, drill, and burn fossil fuels. The petition had a lot of prayers, and Modicia side were proud that all these prayers were favorably acted upon. And... Um, this is just the overview of the national inquiry. We're just uh, pleased to share with you that we had 12 hearings. There were 78 witnesses. Actually, in, in my whole, you know, almost 30 years of practice, this is really a large number of uh, witnesses, 78 people. And we had so many exhibits, 239. And we are proud to have seen a lot of community members. Marinelle is here. Um, articulating their experiences on how climate change has impacted their lives. So now on the findings of the commission, it's very important to note that the commission actually was very um, clear in translating the concept of human rights by drawing into the experiences of farmers, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, and also um, even the LGBT community, young people, and also experts and scientists. So they drew uh, a lot of um, basis and information from a variety of resource persons, um, not only from the academic institutions, from the government, from experts all over the world, and the testimonies of these resource persons and the communities actually showed how the Commission on Human Rights advocated for an understanding of uh, the interrelatedness, the indivisibility, and also the interconnectedness of human rights. It's also good to note that the findings um, dwelt lengthily on the human rights impacts on every sector. 
So uh, when we, when the commission was actually elucidating on the fact that climate change is real, it's anthropogenic, and there was scientific basis, it was also clear and compelling in showing how climate change had an impact uh, in the context of climate change are clearly protected because it's not a perfect situation on the ground. It's also good to note that there was a special duty highlighted to apply the United Nations guiding principles uh, on business and human rights because we do have a lot of uh, international basis where we can draw um, the principles, the human rights principles as basis on how actually the states can protect human rights at only the International Convention on Civil Political Rights, Socioeconomic and Cultural Rights, but also um, I was talking about UNGP principles with respect to business and human rights because states should regulate business operations and business activities. Now, climate justice, uh, to me, for the first time, was well articulated here. Um, for a long time, climate justice was just a concept, a call, a platform. But here, in this specific case, it was uh, given life. And um, the commission, in this case, provided us with a good precedent um, on climate justice. So the, the whole petition, the, the stories and the narratives which were actually shown here um, clearly underscored that this is a climate justice issue. Okay, other, other findings. Um, here, um, underscoring the fact that if governments refuse to engage in meaningful action to mitigate climate change can be categorized as a human rights violation. So this is also something important that for a long time we have seen negligence, okay, neglect, and you know, uh, refusal to take action. So citizens now, uh, with this finding, can then be encouraged to do some action. I know there are judicial remedies here, but if the commission is saying that you have to do something to implement not only your laws, but to make sure that business activities are regulated, uh, are um, and there are new laws issued to make sure that the their impacts on human rights and climate change are actually prevented. Now, the responsibility of business enterprises to respect human rights, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the UNGP, and this is very, very encouraging because you do not see this in a lot of the cases that I've read. And here, um, there was a lot of discussion on the need for uh, due diligence processes, uh, the responsibility of businesses to their stakeholders, the, the need for transparency, full disclosure, and uh, basis to show that they have studied the impacts of their businesses uh, on the human rights of citizens. Now, on the responsibility of carbon majors in the context of climate change and the basis for liability, I'd like to be more specific because it's good to uh, actually quote the findings of the commission against the carbon majors. Uh, the commission said that the products of the carbon majors, um, the respondents in this case, actually contributed to 21.4% of the global emissions and that um, they had early awareness, notice or knowledge of their products' adverse impacts on the environment and climate system. So at the latest in 1965, and it's also important to underscore that the commission uh, stated that these companies, these carbon majors, directly by themselves or indirectly through others singly or through concerted action engaged in willful obfuscation of climate science. And this has prejudiced the right of the public to make informed decisions about their products. So concealing the significant harms that their products produced to the environment and the climate system is, um, is a big, actually, not only an omission, but a breach of human rights. Okay, others, in addition to the liability anchored on obfuscation of climate science, uh, they should also be held to account to their shareholders because the shareholders continue to invest 
in oil exploration for largely speculative purposes. Um, all acts of um, uh, these carbon majors to obfuscate climate science and to delay, derail, or obstruct the transition can be a basis for liability. At the least, they are immoral, but this climate change denial and the efforts to delay the global transition from fossil fuel dependence um, actually still persists. So uh, it's, it's good to underscore here, you know, there was some discussion on that these efforts are not only driven by ignorance, but by greed, because they continue, the, these enterprises continue to fund electoral campaigns of politicians with the intention of slowing down the global movement towards clean, renewable energy. I mean, this is really an important highlight. What else? Um, that the carbon majors have the corporate responsibility to undertake human rights, due diligence, and provide remediation. So um, the businesses, because many of them, as we have mentioned, are actually, they have main offices in developed countries, but uh, they have a responsibility to make sure that wherever they are doing business in, they have to make sure that the impacts, the harms caused by their business operations must be prevented. So they are compelled to undertake human rights due diligence and to be held accountable for any failure to remediate human rights abuses arising from their business operations. Now, one important result of the inquiry is the fact that there is now a climate change observatory. So you do have a source of all the written evidence, the documentation, the videos relating to this petition. And that is very important. So you can build upon all these documents and the findings. Now, the implications of climate litigation. Um, a lot of our amicus, we had about 13 amicus from various institutions all over the world, but one of them, Carol Muffet, okay, from the Center for International Environmental Law, uh, said that the commission's findings, which provides a roadmap of evidence on corporate accountability, he says that this uh, report um, provides a roadmap to that evidence, not only for the people of the Philippines, but also worldwide for lawyers, judges, human rights bodies, and also advocates. So this is very important for, for us who want to actually uh, take an extra mile and uh, draw upon the, this inspiring work. Um, there is now a roadmap of evidence and sets the ground um, to establish further corporate accountability. The commission's recommendations are practical, useful, and can be a basis of objective standards by which to measure the conduct of a range of stakeholders. Now, another expert witness, Sophie Mariana, said that the commission provides more detail about the exact nature and extent of the obligations of states and companies to actually implement the Paris Agreement by reducing emissions and also hastening the energy transition. Okay, carbon majors may be held accountable for human rights violations in the context of climate change anywhere in the world. I've said that before, but I reiterate it because the CHR, while discussing this, asserted uh, its constitutional mandate and its duty to investigate and inquire into the allegations of human rights violations. Um, the commission said while judicial bodies and courts will be prevented from acquiring jurisdiction on companies outside the Philippines, but the CHR said that given its mandate and its duty, it can go, um, it can look into human rights violations caused by activities outside of Philippine territory. So that the wider implication of this finding is that carbon majors may be held accountable, okay? Um, the, other implications, now from, from the perspective of, of several other colleagues, and me included, it's uh, interesting that this opens up the stage for exacting accountability. So there can be a basis for a citizen's example of the Philippines to actually uh, go to the Philippine government and request for um, a compelling action to initiate, you know, actions versus carbon majors, because we want to assert our right as citizens. It can also be a basis for our national government in the Philippines to conduct an immediate review of our, of our several plans. You know, we have the Philippine Development Plan, 
a national climate change action plan, a national framework strategy on climate change, and also a plan on the passage of laws for, or even a plan to amend laws so that we can strictly regulate the conduct of fossil fuel companies and private entities. And in doing so, we make sure that we embody the principles um, in the UNGP, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Okay, the had a lengthy discussion, recommendations addressed to other states, to the national government, to the judiciary, and even to civil society. And that is uh, very, very um, moving, okay? Noteworthy for our actions. And my final insight is that uh, I mentioned about the need to popularize, so therefore we need to pursue our information education activities for legal groups. Meetings, workshops need to be pursued to explore possible judicial and administrative actions. And then roundtable discussions and workshops can also be, can also be done, including engagements with the judiciary. So as a final slide, I'd like to quote one of the petitioners, Joanna Sustento, that for communities affected by the climate crisis, this outcome is a significant step towards getting the justice we truly deserve. Uh, thank you for listening. As we say in Palawan, mayad na teprano, mabuhay. Thank you, Attorney Jerty. Um, next would be uh, a Typhoon Haiyan survivor, one of the petitioners, to share her insights on the implications of the inquiry on youth, gender, and grassroots climate justice. We have Ms. Marinelle Obaldo. Marinelle. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon to our colleagues and friends in Bonn. Um, as we all know, the National Inquiry on Climate Justice is the first in the world inquiry on climate change by um, a national human rights institution, though this is the second attempt to cast um, climate change as a human rights issue. So as um, as petitioners, our theory in this case is simple, that climate change adversely impacts the human rights of the Filipino people. And the top fossil fuel producers of the world, of the world contributed unknowingly um, continue to contribute to this phenomenon. So um, what are the implications to communities and youth, women and men? One is that the communities can actually use the report to lobby national and local climate policies. And with the Commission's recommendations, not only um, to business enterprises and carbon majors, but also to states and different branches of the government, government communities, and CSOs and campaigners are in a better position to urge local and national leaders, including government officials, from the executive, um, legislative, and judicial departments to craft meaningful, uh, meaningful climate laws and policies and implement them with the le level of urgency as highlighted by the commission in its report. So as an independent constitutionally mandated commission um, and an expert government agency when it comes to issues involving human rights, the commission's findings and recommendations become a legitimate legitimate source of information from um, which conversation in different areas and a whole of government approach can be initiated and acted upon. And this is very true with um, our current political climate and the newly elected president in the Philippines who heavily utilized green initiatives to earn votes, also highlighting the shift to renewable energy as one of his important political reform agendas. Second, through this report, um, climate activists found an ally in our advocacy for a greener future where human rights are respected. So activists must continue to fight for climate justice. And the um, national, the NICC, as we call it, the NICC report um, prominently recognizes the importance of activism as contributing to climate justice, climate action, and to an understanding of the climate emergency. So we further demand um, that spaces in society are not encroached upon, but instead enlarged and their networking is not hindered. So the demands that those who are environmental defenders and climate activists are not named as enemies of the state. 
but that legal protection is granted to them, to us, and their human rights, specifically our freedom of speech, um, right to assembly, the right to information, are preserved. Also, the report strongly calls for action to our national, um, to our non-governmental organization and CSOs to con continuously engage in strategic litigation, strengthen and business and human rights norms, um, change public policy, increase government ambition, and create binding precedents catalyzing the movement towards um, zero carbon energy. And the commission even goes as far as to acknowledge um, the role, our role as a third force to guard human rights with respect to companies in a space where the power of multinational corporations grows and the influence of government in some part of the world shrinks. Third, um, the report that also obligates governments to address climate change and mitigate its impact. The governments have an obligation to protect their citizens from human rights abuses. And as this report outlines, climate change causes human rights to be infringed upon. And if the government enables the infringement of the human rights of their citizens, they are therefore breaching their duty. We all know that climate change negatively impacts human rights, specifically in the Philippines. Extreme weather events have killed thousands of Filipinos and injured and displaced countless more. In addition, extreme weather, along with rising temperatures, pollution, and food and water shortages impact the Filipinas' right to health. Climate change, climate change has also led to food insecurity and lack of water and sanitation. Other human rights um, impacted include the right to, um, right to livelihood, adequate housing, preservation of culture, self-determination, um, development, equality, and non-discrimination, and intergenerational equality. Fourth, um, through this report, governments can hold carbon majors accountable for human rights violations in relation to the climate crisis. And most importantly, the communities can hold governments accountable for their inaction. According to the report, um, states have a responsibility to ensure that activities under their jurisdiction or control, whether their own or those of non-state actors, do not harm people in other countries or areas outside their natural national jurisdiction. It therefore follows that um, it is the responsibility of the global north countries to hold their own fossil fuel businesses accountable for how their emissions have infringed upon the human rights of the global populace. This includes um, penalizing carbon majors for their emissions, providing mechanisms to redress victims of climate change impacts, and providing climate financing for the most affected peoples and areas. The Philippine government, um, our Philippine government, is also obligated to protect, protect its citizenry from human rights abuses perpetrated by carbon majors in the fossil fuel industry. That means phasing out existing coal power, power plants and not allowing the establishment of new ones and demanding reparation um, from fossil fuel businesses. Additionally, um, the, our government, our Philippine government, needs to demand action from the global north to take action against the businesses under their jurisdiction. And we as Filipino citizens, I think we need a government that will prioritize fighting for our rights in the face of the climate crisis. And as we all know, the deadline of our climate action to have global carbon dioxide emission, as outlined in the Paris Agreement of 2015, is 2030, which is tough eight years to actually do that. The administration in power for the next six years will have um, the monumental task of transitioning our country to a more sustainable future. And we need a government with concrete plans for phasing out fossil fuels, for adaptation and mitigation, and for ensuring the well-being of all Filipinos during this time. Climate change, um, the report also recommended that government provide legal protection for environmental defenders and establish a finance mechanism for loss and damage which is essential for a country vulnerable to disasters like the Philippines. Um, fifth, 
climate change is a human rights issue. The report rejects the idea that climate is not a matter of civil and political rights because all human rights are related. Climate change affects the right to life, which is fundamental um, civil and pol political right. Climate change impacts, including the degradation of the environment, uh, deprivation of resources, prevalence of life threatening diseases, widespread hunger and mal malnutrition, and extreme poverty, among others, prevent an individual from living a dignified life. So, Climate change adversely affects the individual rights to life, food, water, sanitation, and health, and collective rights to food security, development, self-determination, preservation of culture, equality, and non-discrimination. Climate change also impacts vulnerable populations, including women, children, indigenous people, elderly, um, persons with disabilities, as well as the rights um, of future generations. So um, the report says climate change is also now a major cause of migration and the threat to global security. So the effects of extreme weather events attributed to climate change dehumanizes the hum human person. The combination of loss of lives, deprivation of basic needs, material loss, emotional trauma, and hopelessness that um, our survivors experience with them of their dignity. So, also, six, um, the report uh, finds that climate change affects our right to equality and non-discrimination. Um, and climate change impacts Filipino women in several significant areas, including agriculture production, climate-induced migration, and post-disaster gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. and over the last two decades, mm -hmm. um, 15 times as many infants have died in 24 mm -hmm. months after typhoons than in the typhoon themselves. Of those infants, 80% were girls. And for children, in the case of Typhoon Haiyan, we know, we know that almost 6 million of 14 million people affected were children. An estimated additional 70,000 Filipino children will be malnourished by 2050 due to the impact of climate change. And rising temperature also increased incidence of vector vector borne diseases such as you know malaria, dengue fever, dengue fever, and the heaviest disease burden falling on children. This petition also um, seven. This petition also shows that there is power in our stories, and we have we have seen that, and that communities can win against the carbon majors if we are just united. We can make a great impact and can change the system. Children and youth have a great role to play in making sure that we will not just be fixated with the final report, but also to act on the recommendations of the report, because this is only the start of the battle to climate justice. As Attorney Gerti has said earlier, um, one of the most essential um, parts that the report provides is a roadmap to evidence in holding the carbon majors accountable, not only for the plan for the people of the Philippines, but for affected people um, worldwide, everywhere. So even before this report, that body of evidence comprised a unique and extremely valuable resource in efforts to understand the docu and document the action and impact of carbon major companies and to hold them accountable. In the report, the Commission urges carbon major companies to stop our undermining climate science, to acknowledge that their products have wildly widely contributed to climate change and denounce all forms of climate denial and propaganda and stop funding lobbies, uh, stop funding politicians and other others that spread false information. You should also contribute to funds uh, for implementing mitigation and adaptation measures, not only in the jurisdiction where they operate and in areas that bear the, but also in the areas that bear the brunt of climate impacts. So finally, carbon measures, um, companies that ignore this report and implication do so at their peril. And uh, so they better need uh, more better leaders or better lawyers. With the final report, um, we expect that the government urgently act on these findings and work on people-centered policies that will hold um, climate polluting businesses accountable. Climate change prevents the realization of the right of self-determination and development when victims are trapped 
in an endless cycle of dealing with its diverse impacts. And our lives are spent surviving one climate change impact after another. Filipinos carry the brunt of anthropogenic climate change by paying with our lives. So we remain hopeful that the landmark report would put emphasis um, on Filipinos' right to life. But this is not the end of our fight for climate justice. This is only the beginning. We should sustain, we should sustain our systems and we should work more for a better future for our children and the next generation to come. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for having me, inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, uh, Marinelle. Uh, we know that one of the uh, highlights of the report is the responsibility of the shareholders and uh, also uh, looking at how it would uh, affect the uh, discussions, conversations on uh, loss and damage. Now we have Mr. John Leo Algo, uh, he's the Deputy Executive Director of uh, Living Laudato Si Philippines, uh, JL. Yeah, Mr. Galicia. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Uh, thank you for joining us in this side event, uh, part of SB56. Uh, again, my name is John Leo Algo, and um, I'm here to offer so several more perspectives to this particular discussion on the findings of the National Inquiry on Climate Change. So for the past uh, couple of minutes, we heard perspectives from the legal standpoint, from the youth standpoint, from the grassroots standpoint. So allow me to throw a couple more perspectives into this discussion. So I'll throw science and faith-based in this particular discussion. So first, let's talk about the science a little bit. I think all of us in this uh, most likely are familiar already with what's at stake, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, when I think of climate change, the climate crisis, the number that usually comes to my mind is this particular number right here, 1.5. See, uh, based from the analysis of scientists uh, for the past few years now, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius is the target. It's the target to limit global warming. Uh, unfortunately, based from current projections, no, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has projected in its most recent uh, assessment report, the sixth assessment report, that we are likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius within the next two decades, on or before 2040, unless we take drastic action. So 1.5 basically is considered by many experts as well as a point of no return, meaning irreversible, potentially irreversible climate change impacts, which means, of course, tremendous economic and non-economic loss and damage, and therefore, human rights violations and abuses, especially with the marginalized communities, the most vulnerable peoples bearing the brunt of these particular impacts. Of course, 1.5 degrees Celsius is also uh, embedded in within the Paris Climate Agreement as the you know the ideal target for limiting global warming. The Paris Agreement being uh, adopted in 2015, which is a year that is considered as a landmark year in terms of the presentation and the adoption of several international frameworks and paradigms that presents alternative, more sustainable forms of development. So aside from the Paris Agreement, we've seen in 2015 alone, the SDGs were adopted in 2015. The Sendai Framework was, and disaster risk reduction was adopted around the same time. And of course, in 2015 is also the publication of Pope Francis' encyclical the Laudato Si. So uh, just allow me to uh, spend a minute just um, presenting to you some of the passages from the Laudato Si uh, that directly addresses uh, fossil fuel divestment and, of course, addressing loss and damage. So, uh, and I quote, uh, this is regards to loss and damage, uh, both everyday experience and scientific research show that the gravest effects of all attacks to the environment are suffered by the poorest. We've seen it with, of course, climate change. We've seen it with the COVID-19 pandemic. Practically any crisis you can think of, it's always the most vulnerable peoples that are the most affected economically, in terms of livelihoods, health-wise, you name it, they bear the brunt of it. 
women, youth, indigenous peoples, the urban poor, farmers, etc., etc. This report, the inquiry, to basically frame in a form, in a more formal, policy-oriented sense, uh, the climate change issue as a human rights issue, precisely linking it to that particular passage from the Laudato Si that I just mentioned. Now, in terms of fossil fuel divestment, one of the key messages from the Laudato Si uh, is that, and again, I quote, you can see it on the screen right there, uh, we know that technology based on the use of highly polluting fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, gas, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. And that if there's something that we should have learned, not just from the climate change issue, but from the COVID-19 pandemic issue as well, is that planetary and people's health must not be compromised in favor of, as it says right there, maximizing profits without reflecting on the environmental damage to which they will leave behind for future, and if, I will even add to that, even current generations, current and future generations. So uh, this is the context to which I will present the following statements. Uh, firstly, uh, Attorney Griffey already mentioned some of the uh, and many of these are recommendations that were presented in this report. Uh, again, some are oriented for governments, for financial institutions, civil society groups, etc. And many, some of these are relatively uh, novel in a sense, uh, especially in the Philippine context. No? Like, for example, I don't think many people are necessarily aware of the UN guiding principles no, for business and human rights. So some of the recommendations there that oriented to that could really help push the envelope, so to speak. But many of these other recommendations, especially for governments, no? like, for example, discouraging dependence on fossil fuels, uh, concretizing responsibility of businesses, discouraging anthropogenic contributions to climate change and compensating victims. And, and you can flash all of, all of them on the screen. Uh, basically, what we're trying to say here is these are suggestions, these are solutions that have been proposed for decades, probably even before Marinel and I were even born. But the bottom line is because now you have this particular findings from a human rights inquiry, the importance of these particular findings are elevated. These solutions take even more meaning because of this particular report. Now, uh, in terms of divestment in the Philippines, there has been some progress in recent years. Uh, for example, uh, we've seen all of these banks that, uh, for example, Bank of the Philippine Islands, Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, Security Bank, Banco de Oro, four of the 15 biggest banks in the country, they all have made recent public pronouncements about their willingness to divest, at least direct coal financing, to avoid direct coal financing within as late as 2033, and even as a rule of thumb, and that's a quote. Uh, but the thing is, the uh, let's just say that that's direct coal financing. That's the pronouncement. But studies have shown that there are other ways for these banks and other financial institu institutions to indirectly finance not just coal-fired power plant construction, some of which are still in the pipeline despite the coal moratorium, but also fossil gas power plants in the next decade. And again, I mentioned four of the 15 biggest banks in the Philippines have coal uh, divestment policies, but about the rest of them. That's still a lot of private financing that's still invested in basically dirty energy and the associated impacts on not just, of course, our national pursuit of mitigation, but also the, the well-being of marginalized communities. Uh, the On the other hand, from the faith-based sector, for example, uh, the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines, along with Caritas Filipinas, uh, they have made a commitment as recently as this 28th of January through a pastoral letter on the climate emergency and the planetary crisis to fully divest from fossil fuel funding banks by 2025, uh, among other commitments related, for example, rights of nature. But 
Uh, this shows, of course, that more and more sectors, more and more groups within the Philippines are following the basically the, the global trend that's emerging in terms of divestment from fossil fuels. And it comes at a very critical time for the Philippines, which is one of the most vulnerable countries to the climate crisis. But unfortunately, we are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels. And of course, we're not, we're not isolating the Philippines because many parts of the world also isolate fossil fuels, but because we are a highly vulnerable country. And with this particular report now basically out there, it, it's publicized. The, these, again, these particular aspects of our reality take even more importance. Like, for example, we rank as the seventh largest coal expansionist in the world out of 43 countries uh, as of 2020. 17 new coal-fired power plants have been added to our coal fleet since 2010. Uh, on the other hand, we are the second largest fossil gas pipeline owner in Southeast Asia. 14, uh, actually, supposed to say 29.9 gigawatts, excuse me, uh, because 14.1 gigawatts are actually courtesy of just one corporation, which also happens to be the largest coal developer in the Philippines. So uh, you can see these uh, mechanisms coming into play. Again, there's also um, fossil gas financing coming from, mostly actually from foreign sources. But banks here in the Philippines, not, um, they serve more as, it, they could be intermediaries, or they could also issue bonds, underwritings, etc. And despite the fact that we've had a renewable energy law for the past 14 years, 14 years, our renewable share in the energy mix, at least in terms of power generation, because there are different metrics, but in terms of power generation at least, the renewable energy share in the energy mix have been decreasing for quite a while now. And considering we have an RE law that just began full implementation last year, uh, if I recall correctly, that needs to change. And this is the context for hopefully the trend to be reversed. And this is why some of the recommendations to the government from the CHR inquiry take even more importance. Like redirecting capital to activities that promote emissions reductions, building infrastructures needed to address and respond to the physical impacts of climate change. This is for divestment for financial institutions. And uh, enhancing finance mobilization to deliver the scale of resources needed to achieve climate plans, especially for adaptation. Uh, and again, now we're starting to see here again the interconnectedness of the whole climate nexus, because the next recommendation also pertains to loss and damage, providing enhanced and additional support for activities addressing loss and damage. Again, these are calls that we've been probably making for decades, again, before some of us were even in, the, in this kind of work, but they take even more importance now, especially the ESG criteria screening. So those are some of the recommendations. That's the context that needs to be put out there because it elevates the importance. Now, in terms of loss and damage, uh, I don't think we need to spend that much time, you know, talking about how at high risk the Philippines is because, you know, we all know that. But I'll just mention this, two things. Number one, the Philippines has more than 506 billion pesos of climate-related loss and damage in the past decade. That's 98% of all types of loss and damage in the Philippines, equivalent to 0.5% of our GDP every year. That's how big, that's how important uh, addressing loss and damage is. And number two, the Philippines, based from, uh, by the way, the previous uh, data that I mentioned comes from the Department of Finance. That was a report published uh, a couple of months ago. The second fact that I like to point about loss and damage, 5.7 million Filipinos are internally displaced as of last year. That's number two worldwide behind China. So... What this tells us is that it's not just the su sudden onset events, the typhoons that we need to worry about. What about the slow onset events? What about the sea level rise, ocean acidification, land degradation? And if you look at what is in store for the Philippines, these are based from our projections of our uh, local weather climate agency, Pagasa. 2.3 degrees Celsius potential global warming by 2050. 40% decrease or increase, that's the maximum, in terms of average change in rainfall, depending on your location. So, uh, for example, uh, an agricultural community, they could either see their crops get wiped out by a heavy rainfall event in the blink of an eye, 
or we could see a repeat of 2016 when there was an El Nino Indus drought that was a tremendous problem for farmers all around the Philippines and further highlighted the fact that the farming community in the Philippines is one of the poorest sectors, which should not be the case because it threatens many aspects of our life, nationally, individually, you name it. And this is why um, among the recommendations that are very important from this report is, of course, the establishment of a loss and damage funding facility, which, of course, will be one of the most crucial points of discussion, debate, I would say debate, at COP27. So from our perspective, any funding facility for loss and damage must be anchored, of course, on the polluter pays principle, which is deeply embedded in the CHRs inquiry, that polluter pays. And secondly, it should be that the source of financing has to be sourced from both public and private spheres. What this means, of course, is when we say private spheres, we mean uh, of course, from carbon majors, penalties, taxation, that, of course, that might depend on the country's perspective. And of course, when we say public sphere, we refer to the commitment of developed countries, the $100 billion financial commitment from 2020 that is still not complete at this point. Whatever the new uh, adaptation finance goal will be, we're mentioning this mitigation and adaptation finance because we need to recognize that if we want to avert loss and damage, we have to strengthen mitigation and adaptation. We cannot treat these pillars of climate action and finance in isolation because to do so would be injustice, not just to communities, but also to entire countries, especially the most vulnerable ones, grants-based finance, so on and so forth. And then if you can show the other, uh, what we expect to be core principles of a hopefully will be established loss and damage funding facility easier access for vulnerable nations empowering local communities very important when we're trying to avoid any form of human rights abuse or violation that threatens the right to livelihoods the right to basic necessities and of course the highest human right of all the right to life uh, one of my favorite quotes from attorney oposa uh, here in the philippines and, uh, of course, equal allocation for sudden and slow onset events. I think that's another very important aspect that needs to be focused upon. And then, uh, when it comes to loss and damage recommendations, uh, it's very simple for governments. Um, and this has already been covered earlier by our previous speakers, but just to highlight again, for example, implementing adaptation and mitigation measures, uh, guaranteeing that climate actions do not exacerbate existing inequalities. And then moving forward, agreeing to create, again, a separate finance mechanism that was already dis discussed, and improving the influence and impact of multilateral and regionally targeted funding mechanisms for both mitigation and adaptation, because you cannot take them in isolation from L&D action and finance. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, basically, the message is very simple. When it comes to Way forward, it can be summed up with one sentence, invest in our future. I'm not just talking about money here. When we say invest in our future, invest resources, invest manpower, invest political will. And of course, we need to invest, you know, not just our, all those things. We're talking about buying in as well to this whole process because there are now new avenues that are open thanks to this particular CHR inquiry findings. You can take them to litigation if you prefer. Of course, we need to also work with other sectors, governments, uh, other civil society groups, even businesses. You can find a bridge there even. Uh, but the bottom line is this. We should not wait climate action. The more injustices, the more human rights abuses, the more human rights violations, and we're just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. You know, um, I don't want to go to this COP in Egypt, and basically at the end of the COP, I'll just say to myself again, it's basically the same events. You just change the number of COP. We, we have to end that. 
And hopefully, whether at the national or global level, we can capitalize on the momentum presented by this landmark inquiry by the Commission of Human Rights. Invest in our future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, JL. And now uh, we're delighted to have the Minister of uh, the Climate Change Commission uh, in the country, the Philippines, Secretary Robert Borges. Um, a round of applause, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodney. And um, thank you to um, our colleagues, to um, Yeb Sanyo, um, Attorney Anda, um, my fellow Filipinos who are here, our friends from uh, the uh, civil society organization, and our friends from around the world. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm new in the job, in the position, as uh, my friend Rodney knows here. Uh, but we've been working very closely on the climate change, uh, climate, uh, change agenda in the Philippines. And I welcome this opportunity uh, to engage uh, an important um, uh, sector of Philippine society and indeed uh, of uh, the world uh, when, it climbs, uh, when it comes to climate change. Um, the NICC, we believe, is, um, provides the opportunities uh, for uh, the entire Filipino nation uh, to be engaged and to enlarge the space for discussion, uh, not just on climate change, but particularly on human rights. And uh, we're very encouraged by uh, this development because it shows uh, the whole of society approach uh, that we have as a democracy. Um, it's not a perfect democracy, I'll be the first to admit that, but uh, the space is there. And uh, I would say that uh, the uh, NICC is a landmark um, document to come out of uh, the C uh, uh, Commission of Human Rights of the Philippines. And for me, it's instructive and informative insofar as the work that we do in the climate change and its nexus with human rights. Um, I'm tasked here to provide uh, an insight on the impact of uh, the um, uh, this latest development on the Philippines COP27 agenda. And I might just say that uh, what it does is it first recasts and redefines the discussions and uh, the debate within the Philippines on uh, what constitutes uh, climate change action, what constitutes uh, just uh, climate change action, and what constitutes the priorities, therefore, of the government when it comes to climate change action. Um, the Philippine government, indeed the Philippine society, was very well, very well aware of this approach going into uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. It was, uh, in our estimation, a people-centered approach on the part of the Philippines. And uh, human rights, upholding the human rights of Filipinos was essential to uh, the creation of uh, the national positions then. Uh, but what does this really have, what is its impact uh, on, on what we're going to do on COP27? Um, NCCAP, or our own um, uh, climate change uh, adaptation uh, pro program, no, um, I believe remains the same, basically the same. Uh, but it gives a better sense of urgency into the work that we do. Um, I will um, have to say that this particular outcome or development uh, underscores the, on under the ongoing debate and discussion in the global setting on uh, loss and damages. And might I say, uh, this um, sheds, uh, brings the spotlight to what we feel, what I feel is the repressed discussion and debate on liability and culpability, as well as responsibility and compensation. Uh, this is something that's uh, very important to the Philippines as a developing country, and not just a developing country, but as, as a nation that's uh, climate vulnerable. Uh, for the longest time, we have had to deal uh, with the impacts of climate change. And while there have been progressive um, developments when it comes to the devotion of uh, resources uh, to climate change adaptation and mitigation over the years, uh, the answer is very clear. We really need to do more, but we cannot owing to the limited uh, resources that we have. And in this regard, it is important for us to work with uh, uh, the global community to further capacitate us. Now, um, I don't think it's a time for us to be uh, pointing fingers at everybody because at the end of the day, uh, human beings are responsible for the state that we are in. 
and uh, we ultimately need to do as much as we can. But this type of development is instructive and informative not only for the Philippines, not only for the developing uh, nations, not only for uh, particularly vulnerable uh, societies, but also for uh, developed and industrial states who we feel should do more. Um, we came here to, uh, we're here at uh, SB 56, uh, coming from um, Stockholm 50. And the rallying call for the Philippines was climate justice. To those who are least responsible for climate change, to those who have the least resources, to those who are most vulnerable and at risk, we need to do more. Now conversely, to those who are most responsible, to those with the most resources, you have to do more. Um, the question here is, is that enough? Uh, judging by the progress of uh, the discussions and the debate here uh, at SB 56, we know what the answer is. And it uh, casts a pall on uh, the rhetoric uh, for the entire world that we're doing as much as we can. But when you hold the, a mirror to ourselves, and this is essentially what uh, uh, the Commission of Human Rights of the Philippines has done, it's forced us to hold a mirror to ourselves and ask us, what have we really done? Have we done enough? And are we going to do more? Um, the answer is plain to see. There are stakeholders, there are nations who uh, owing to their positions, their circumstances, they want more things to be done, but they're not capacitated to do so. Other countries who have the capacity to do so may have professed, may have expressed that they're willing to do so, but the reality is, and it's very sad and regrettable, we're all mired in uh, further debates and discussions. And I will be very honest, I'll be very candid, and perhaps accuse me of being undiplomatic, uh, but really uh, going by uh, what, we're, uh, what we have done so far, it's pushing back the agenda on action. At this time, what we need is uh, really timely action that delivers results. Uh, the Philippines is working uh, on its own to provide the resources uh, to, for climate change and adaptation. We've seen that in our budget, uh, in our climate change expenditure tagging, it's increased throughout the years. But the challenge of climate change also grows through the years. So for us, it is a moving target. And it's heartbreaking to see uh, so, many, uh, so many communities being negatively affected, uh, but uh, so many resources being gone to waste also. Loss and damages that are very, very real for us. Let me cite uh, the four recent typhoons that struck the Philippines. Um, in the middle of summer, uh, the, ex the, the loss and damages were ex uh, estimated at $1.6 billion. Now, for the Philippines, what does this represent? This represents 60% of our government's budget health insurance budget for 60% also of our population. So that's uh, around 60 million people. Budget that could have gone for, uh, uh, to, that would have been put to better use. Uh, so uh, this development from our Commission on Human Rights gives us the, uh, acts rather, as the catalyst for things that can be done. and squarely uh, puts the framework on what climate justice is. It's really responsibilities, not just of states, but also of uh, uh, companies uh, who, uh, willingly or unwillingly, uh, continue to involve themselves in activities that clearly contribute to climate change. And uh, we, at the receiving end, it's not just livelihoods, but lives that are at stake. Uh, so what does this mean for the Philippines for COP27? Our priorities have always remained the same. We've always had the same clarion call since, uh, uh, since the Paris Agreement. And when uh, the president uh, agreed to sign on to it, uh, the emphasis have always been the same. But what does uh, this, again, development show us? It shows us that there is a need to address fundamentally uh, the problems that we have, the problems that we say we are addressing, 
but our actions point out to a different place of origin in a different direction, sadly, of where we are going. So we have to ask ourselves, um, is it really just um, uh, rhetoric that we're working at? Or are we genuinely involved in the process of changing our realities so that we can effectively address the challenges of uh, climate change? That is an answer that will be that's a question that will be answered here and in COP27, uh, we internationally, uh, as a global community, but for the Philippines, it underscores the need for us to act urgently on what, uh, uh, what our communities are already experiencing day to day. Uh, on the part of the Climate Change Commission, we're working very hard to provide um, uh, suppletory budget and support for local government units to assist them in climate change adaptation projects. But again, these are all uh, these are all actions that are uh, that do not uh, address the root causes of uh, climate change. And the Philippines can only do so much. Uh, we're working with our own uh, bilateral partners in uh, providing support, for example, in our just transition to a, uh, a greener economy. But the question is, uh, it will take time and it will need a lot of resources. Um, how many, uh, how much of the world uh, is able to provide that support? If the Philippines needs billions of dollars, what about the rest? It opens up a lot of questions. It opens up a Pandora's box of moral questions as well. Uh, do we prioritize the Philippines? Or what about the, the Pacific uh, uh, small island developing states who are, uh, uh, who are in a, a more difficult situation? So how do we prioritize uh, these, uh, uh, these countries? Or if we do, uh, what mechanism is available? And perhaps the fundamental question really is, um, are we is the world going to own up to its responsibilities uh, on climate change? Are governments going to own up to their responsibilities, not just as governments, but also of companies uh, under their jurisdiction created in, uh, created in their own countries, who knowingly, as, we, uh, as we're well aware of, knowingly uh, continue uh, with these uh, deleterious um, uh, activities uh, to the climate? Um, I don't want to end this, um, uh, this talk on a very negative note because I still believe that the narrative can be changed and that uh, it really takes uh, a whole of society and a whole of world approach, I would say, uh, to, uh, to address the issues that we're confronted with. But the first thing that we should do is to look at ourselves, look at you, look at everybody here in the room, and ask, are we really doing enough? And have we really answered the right questions that need to be asked. And I think uh, that uh, for this reason, uh, the Philippines Commission on Human Rights uh, Outcome, uh, on the human rights inquiry in the Philippines, is very helpful to set into context once again uh, our responsibility as individuals, as governments, and as global citizens in order to address the issues of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary uh, Robert Borja. So we'll have about uh, five minutes uh, for question and answer. If any one of you would like to ask some uh, questions, uh, our panelists are ready to answer. But of course, if you don't have any, <laughs> uh, you can approach uh, Secretary Borja and even contact us for further discussions. Uh, uh, yes. If I may, I think it uh, provides uh, further impetus for the Philippines to work very closely with uh, similarly situated countries. And um, um, we don't want to go into a, a, a noisy debate, uh, so to speak. But what we really want is uh, actions, decisions with results. Um, we don't know if there is time for us to do this. Uh, but we are fully committed to the process and we're fully committed to engaging uh, everyone we need to, uh, including the civil society organizations, uh, to do uh, as much as we can. Um, uh, we don't claim to be heroes for climate change. Uh, 
our reason too is that uh, we have to protect our own national interests and it just so happens that our interests are reflective of the interests of most if not all of the developing world. So we're willing to do that. Uh, we do hope that uh, this particular uh, development from the Philippines Commission on Human Rights will indeed be instructive and informative uh, so that uh, we're shaken uh, and uh, able to realize that uh, in the interest of climate justice, our collective moral fiber should be outraged by the inaction that uh, we have been uh, led to, this, this stupor, so to speak, uh, uh, in these very halls. These very halls should provide us with the hope and the inspiration to do much for the world. And we know that uh, under this multilateral approach, uh, positive changes have happened throughout the world. Uh, but we really, really need to do more. And uh, we will continue to be a strong advocate, a strong voice uh, for developing nations in our demand for climate justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Secretary. Yes, uh, our friend from GIZ, Prince, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Secretary. My name is Bernd Liss. I'm uh, from GIZ. I'm heading the section Climate Change, Climate Policy. And I've been working in the Philippines, uh, actually was based there for seven years. I've experienced uh, Haiyan or Yolanda, as you called it, and it was really devastating also visiting Tacloba afterwards. So I'm, I'm really, I feel with you and also can, can uh, say that uh, this is something that uh, nobody should experience. Uh, thank you for pointing out the common responsibilities and also uh, looking into what kind of action can be taken now by the global community but also locally and especially also in the Philippines uh, because uh, you said, uh, have we done enough? Uh, uh, more needs to be done and I fully agree also for us. Uh, we need to do more uh, in, in, the, in the global community. But you pointed also out uh, that the Philippines uh, is uh, probably well advised to liaise and to share with other vulnerable countries. Uh, the Philippines once had the chair of the vulnerable cli uh, Climate Vulnerable uh, Forum, also of the V20. How do you at the moment associate uh, also with the efforts uh, led by Bangladesh and uh, uh, other members uh, within the CVF? And um, how are the discussions uh, with the uh, international community uh, working uh, in really getting the support, but also joining forces that we can do something jointly on climate action? Uh, thank you very much. And um, at the outset, I'd like to thank you and uh, the German government. Uh, we've already um, spoken with them in the last uh, three months. And might I say that uh, bilateral cooperation is key uh, towards uh, addressing the needs of developing countries. And I would have to thank um, uh, the German government for uh, being very open with us and for working, especially right now, on three uh, uh, climate change projects. Um, that is important for us to be um, further capacitated to, to work on climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, the Philippines continues to support um, uh, Bangladesh and indeed all countries no, who are uh, climate vulnerable. Uh, but uh, our approach right now, and uh, it's part of the re reassessment that we're doing, is to, uh, while we're working with um, uh, the multilateral um, uh, framework, we're also working very strongly with our bilateral partners and regional partners uh, for financing. Uh, our uh, Ministry of Finance or the Department of Finance has been at the forefront of trying to transform our markets to make it more uh, uh, ready to transition uh, to a greener economy. Um, this undertakes, uh, this, uh, this requires that our private sector be involved as well. So that's a particular focus of um, our uh, Department of Finance. But it's also important for us to learn from uh, the uh, uh, experiences of other countries. And uh, uh, we are working towards now uh, uh, with uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, as a possible focal point uh, for uh, best practices and lessons learned when it comes to climate change adaptation mitigation projects within Southeast Asia. Uh, I think the reason behind that is um, as a, a regional association, uh, the mechanisms are already there uh, for uh, coordination and for evaluation, monitoring and evaluation. So that's key. Uh, but uh, going uh, to your 
earlier question, it's important that the Philippines uh, re-engages and reinvests, I think is uh, the, the correct uh, term, in uh, the uh, multilateral process. Um, it's, again, I would have to be candid. Uh, the multilateral process is not something that uh, is easily understood by people beyond uh, beyond those who are directly involved. I myself, uh, when I was with our mission to the UN, um, had, uh, of course, I have a different appreciation for what it's done, especially uh, for norm setting, uh, for the normative framework for any international uh, global action to be done. But then again, it takes years. But uh, on the issue of climate change, there is that sense of urgency because we, the environment, the, the clock is ticking, the climate uh, clock is ticking, and uh, we really need to do more. Um, maybe beyond CVF, uh, we, we can strengthen that, but beyond that, uh, more uh, uh, intercessional uh, uh, meetings and coordination can happen. Of course, you know we work with G77, uh, but uh, there has to be more. Um, our sense, actually, for uh, ASEAN is that we agree on a particular item because we don't have a common ASEAN position. Uh, for climate change, but we believe that there is a specific uh, point of climate change which we can have uh, a common position or statement on, and that can be a basis for uh, a stronger position, a collective position, and we hope that we can work with other um, uh, organizations as well and other and other thought and uh, thought and action leaders uh, similarly situated. Um, but uh, that's the direction we are going. Uh, we will not um, we will not hesitate to work uh, with partners uh, from the uh, developed world uh, because we recognize too that there are partners who have helped us uh, through the years but, but we do need to work more and for the Philippines if we can work also with partners similarly situated, then we would be very happy to work with them too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our time is up. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Robert. And uh, we'll continue our conversation towards COP. And during COP27, we'll have our second uh, Bernadita Smuller climate conversations on climate finance. And of course, we'll bring this message on climate change and human rights towards COP27. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yeb, Marinel, JL, and Thank Attorney Jerthy. Thank Maraming you. Salamat po. Thank you. How do you say uh Thank you. Thank you.